Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. I am Stephanie Steffer, and I'm the business director with CVI Connect. If this is your first time joining us for one of our CVI Connect live events, thank you so much. And I see a few familiar names joining us as well. It's so nice to have you back. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the CVI Connect system or being notified for more events like this, I'm going to go ahead and post our newsletter registration link in the chat. Feel free to sign up there. I have a feeling that's where most of you guys hear about our events. If you are watching the recording of this presentation, you can also visit our website, cviconnect.co, and sign up for our newsletter there as well. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to remind everyone it, to keep your line muted throughout today's presentation. If you think of any questions, you are encouraged to type those into the chat. Um, we do have a lot of great information planned for you today, and this presentation is likely to run the entire length of time, possibly a little bit longer. So we will compile all the questions and answers and some resources into a follow-up email for all registered participants. And remember that we will not be answering any student specific questions since we do not know the child and it would be difficult for us to speak to their case. As a reminder, I am recording today's session and afterward, while we might have to do some editing, we will then load the video to our YouTube channel and I will also post this link in our, the chat now in case that's something that you're interested in watching any of our previous sessions that we've hosted, um, as well as just some how-to videos and other support topics. Today, our main focus is on literacy for children with CVI. And reminder, prior to the session, we were asking viewers to have a basic understanding of the CVI diagnosis, the visual and behavioral characteristics of CVI as identified by Dr. Christine Roman Lancy, her CVI range scores, um, the assessment tool, and the three phases of CVI, because today we will build upon these concepts throughout today's presentation. Today, I have with me Judy Endicott, and I am so glad to have her with us today. Judy has spent her career as a reading specialist, and when she became grandmother to River, an amazing little boy who also happens to have CVI, she began to join these two worlds together to support him along his journey through literacy. Judy teaches the courses through Perkins on this very topic, and I recently had the privilege of taking one of her online courses, the Literacy and CVI um, High Phases 2 and 3 course that they offer. I highly recommend that course, um, and I'm sure the others are great as well. I just haven't had the chance to take those yet. Um, if you're interested in learning more about literacy for children with CVI. Judy, thank you so much for agreeing to join us today. I will hand this over to you. My pleasure, Stephanie. Thank you for those kind words and welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to start by explaining to you that I'm, as you know, a parent and a grandparent, um, a former retired educator. Um, and a researcher who um, is interested in continuing my journey of learning as much as I can about CVI and literacy. Um, my background includes teaching in a learning disabled classroom, in different special education settings. Um, I was a regular education teacher and also a reading specialist and a reading consultant. My role involved writing IEPs and working with families for student, with students who were placed in place full-time regular education, but required an IEP for specially designed instruction. When my grandson was, was hospitalized and acquired CVI 11 years ago, um, our world changed. I had not, never heard of CVI, didn't even know what the initials stood for. Um, so I began learning. I began learning as much as I could. And I also re-entered the area of research in the area of literacy. Um, because although I'd worked with literacy with students who were in great need, I never totally worked or nor understood what it meant to have a visual impairment called cortical visual impairment. Um, may, please understand that I made plenty of mistakes. Um, I continue to learn, I continue to make mistakes, but I think the comment of when you know better, you do better, that's why I call my presentation Literacy Through the CBI Lens, Just Stay Beginning. 
Um, I want to put out, <laughs> put out a word of warning because the videos that I will share with you are a little bit rough. Um, I, it's hard to work with my grandson and tape video him at the same time so that I can present it to you. So bear with me, um, they're a little bit rough. All right, let's get started. Literacy through the CVI lens. Um, it's important for you to understand that there is science to guide the practice of reading instruction for typical learners, for those at risk for reading disabilities and those diagnosed with dyslexia. But there is no research, there are no research studies focusing on how to develop literacy and teach reading and writing to individuals with CVI. There are no commercially published programs for learners with CVI and knowledge of the impact of CVI on the learner, the individual's CVI characteristics, needs, and strengths that needs to be used to customize all parts of the individual's learning. So my perspective that I share with you today is based upon the application of effective research-based interventions customized to give my grandson visual access to literacy instruction. So the work of experts in both the fields of literacy and cortical visual impairment combines the basis of what I share with you today. I have merely made the connection. Today's content will include the CVI overlay, what I call the CVI overlay, CVI characteristics from Roman Lancy, and those characteristics through the lens of my grandson. I'll include reading research, the science of reading, and research information and a demonstration of a small selection of phonemic awareness activities. I wish to thank Dr. Christine Remelancy for her years of work, the knowledge she has shared, and her ongoing contributions to our collective understanding of CVI. I've learned from many, but her work is the foundation of what I'm going to share with you today. My, you might have heard, I hope you have, Roman Lancy's quote, CVI is the disability of access, access to the visual world. I contend that brain-based visual impairments with or without additional physical, cognitive, and sensory needs will put an individual at risk for reading difficulties. Students with learning challenges typically need extended, explicit, systematic, prescriptive instruction. They need more practice with a mediator over time. They need monitored, guided, and supported practice with feedback. In addition, students with CVI will need visual aspect, excuse me, visual access to all aspects of the visual world. And how we provide that visual access leads me to my conceptual framework of cortical visual impairment literacy. So there's a lot here. The left box is specific to CVI. It's based on the work of Christine Roman Lancy with additional complexity information from Matthew Tejan. The middle box labeled program includes the components of an effective research-based literacy program. <clears throat> Putting the two together should result in a structured literacy program based upon the science of reading that is visually accessible and instructionally appropriate for the learner with CBI. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me show you the CBI part in greater detail. So the CBI overlay components, beginning with assessment as all good instruction does, the components are built upon the assessment information that is gained from the functional vision assessment, the CBI range. Included with that is a learning media assessment, highly recommended the sensory balance and approach to learning media planning for students with CVI. Newly published, if you don't have it, I highly encourage you to get it. And I'm not gonna read through the additional assessments there. They're all customized as per individual need made by team decisions 
and other experts in the field. It also includes the student profile, <clears throat> which I refer to as a compilation of important student information that all stakeholders in a child's education have to use. Parents, of course, are part of every part of this process. And instruction, what I call the heart of the CVI teaching, includes the CVI core instruction learning conditions and strategies of salient features, comparative thought, and mediated learning. We include with that balance of task and environment complexity, using the information from what's the complexity framework from Matthew Tejan, and a CVI sketch. <clears throat> so you see, <clears throat> excuse me, the CVI overlay, including the CVI visual and behavioral characteristics listed there. I'm gonna be going into each one of them, showing you some examples from my grandson, so I won't read them here. And you see that I've mentioned <clears throat> the CVI core instruction, which includes explicit teaching and systematic demonstration using salient features, comparative thought, and mediated learning, plus the CVI schedule, and as mentioned before, a balanced task and environment. Because I believe that with ongoing assessment, current knowledge of CVI characteristics, and CVI core instruction, we can provide appropriate accommodations and interventions that are visually accessible for the individual CVI throughout his or her day. All of the CVI overlay then is used with instruction in the core areas of literacy, which include phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, comprehension, fluency, and I've added spelling and writing because although they were not part of the National Reading Panel report, they were not studied, they are a part of effective literacy instruction. I hope you've heard this before because this is very important. When you've met one child with CVI, you've met one child with CVI. Children with CVI with cortical visual impairment are a diverse group. The characteristics are what they ha all have in common, but those characteristics will be unique to each individual. Individuals with CVI have a variety of cognitive, motor, social, and visual abilities. That's why every decision made as a family and team needs to be rooted in the understanding of the current CVI phase and the individual's unique visual and behavioral characteristics. So that quote in mind, I'm going to show you some CVI characteristic overlays specific to my grandson. Uh, I'm going to share my thinking in hopes that it shows you how I blend my current knowledge of his current visual function to research-based practices. You're gonna be seeing discrete activities out of sequence, um, but I, I'm trying to demonstrate a point and hopefully that will happen. Um, I also mentioned that perhaps ideas of what I do with him will help you, but keeping in mind, there, it has to be built on your individual's characteristics and CVI phase. So here you see the first characteristic, color preference. We use color to selectively draw his attention and organize information for him. So the left image shows us reinforcing a long, long A spelling patterns. As he segments the sounds in a word, he writes the letter or letters that represent the sound. So for example, the top one under AI would be as he's, he's writing as he goes, ch, he writes CH, a, he writes the AI and he puts, makes the N sound and he puts the N. The middle column, the, whoops, sorry about that. The middle image where fight is used as the base word. And you'll see here, we're adding meaning chunks or morphemes to those, that same base word. The right image 
shows a newly learned sound, a U, where the color alerts his visual attention to help him visualize to see that AU vowel team in the, the longer work. When he is proficient, we drop the use of color in that instance. Next characteristic is need for movement and movement attracts his attention. Uh, we work in a quiet, uncluttered, uh, very consistent environment. Um, movement can also enhance his learning. Um, you're gonna see a video on the uh, left hand one I'm gonna play in a minute. You'll see that sorting, he's sorting here. And it's a very powerful way to draw his visual attention to a target, um, in this case, a spelling pattern target. And for me, it gives me an opportunity to interject um, comparative language, salient features, uh, corrections, whatever makes sense. Um, when some of the things that have been um, useful for him involving movement are finger pointing when he's reading, um, making words with magnetic letters, as you see in the right hand image. Um, these are all very productive, but I mention also that they weren't always productive. All right, here we go. AI. 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 A. B. Trail. Ail. Ail. Afraid. Afraid. Wow, that was excellent. OK. Here's another activity demonstrating how we use movement. Um, I call this activity word puzzles. Close. That's a, going to be a closed syllable. Toss. Mm -hmm. Two. Perfect. How many syllables in that word? Two. Costume. Good. Move. Let's move America and costume out of the way. Try one more. Go ahead. Pull it over. Can you read that? Base. Oh, first syllable. Close syllable. Bass. Cape. Put together. Escape. Excellent. Which syllable there has the consonant, vowel, consonant, silent eight? Which syllable? This one? Yep. And so you heard the Ape. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, so you saw there where I weave in a review of sounds. And also you probably noticed that you can complete an activity like this or he can complete an activity like this without having read or worked on the decoding. So that he can do that activity independently. And then in the role as the mediator, I can work with him to hear him read the words. Visual latency. We know that visual latency is the delay in a visual response when a target is presented. Now, when I see latency from my grandson, I troubleshoot with his characteristics in mind. Um, I wonder if it is, I ask myself, is this thinking time? Is this uh, his way of processing some form of sensory information before putting eyes on tasks? Um, or is it overload and he needs a visual break or a total task break? Or is it an unbalanced task and environment um, where something is interfering and causing the latency? Or is it a result of lack of motivation, which is also a possibility? So know your learner. What helps my grandson is wait time, um, allocating more time for any kind of lesson. There's, it always takes longer than I plan. Um, Pre-teaching works effectively and we always do a warm up. Lack of eye contact does not mean not listening. And you see in the parentheses, but sometimes it does. 
Um, here is, a, is an example of shared reading. The slide was my turn. You can see by the size of the text. Um, and he decided that he needed some movement. I give my grandson a purpose for listening so that as, at the conclusion of being read to, I ask, I return to that purpose. So I know he's listening or I find out quickly that he's not and we go from there. So again, know your learner. Visual field preferences is the next CBI characteristic. We encourage my grandson to position materials in his best visual field. Um, we always use a book stand um, for what he's reading. Uh, we will also raise the computer screen, um, my iPad, to where his vision is best. So again, we experiment and we encourage him to be the one to be in control. Need for light. Here we also encourage him to take charge and advocate for what he needs. Um, Backlit screens are what we use for reading connected text. You'll see here that there's glare on the screen. Um, with him, I double check. I was my perspective filming this that we were picking up the glare, but it was not his visual field. So make sure you check for glare. Distance viewing, difficulty with distance viewing. Um, what he can view beyond 15 to 20 feet depends on his familiarity with the target and if the target is moving. So the picture of the cat on the left-hand side would have been difficult for him had he not taken that screenshot during a conversation with his grandmother. And he knew that cat, so he was, it was easy for him once he blew it up to identify the cat, plus the cat was moving. The middle picture um, is we collect, or he photographs signs all the time, and we make them into a reading and learning experience for both um, expanding his vocabulary and his concepts, and, and we bring a lot of information into that. So he had stopped, he had asked me along when we were driving if he could take the screenshot of the picture, or take, take the picture, and then we returned to it and blew it up and read it later. So a typical experience for us is for me to point out a target. I try to label the salient features and connect it to something that is meaningful to him or something that I know he knows so that we make that bridge into his visual library. Um, then he'll usually say, take a picture um, so that we can return to it later. He can enlarge the image and he can see the details of the picture. We did that just recently with a label on the side of a truck, a pine cones on a tree. So I'm always with, I'm always, always have my phone with me. Difficulty with visual novelty. When we can, and if it's necessary and important to the learning, we connect the 3D to the 2D. So you see the image on the left-hand side is an image of information that was inserted in his new digital camera packaging. And I knew that he needed to know what the parts of the camera were, but he could not visually take in the information. Um, so we made it into a reading lesson. Um, so basically I'll show you in a minute what else we did with that. Um, but keep in mind also that 3D and 2D changes in perspectives can make a known target novel. Um, I put in the fly fly uh, example here because with the font on the bottom, when I used the text the size appropriate for him, I noticed that it was connecting the F and the L, which is nothing, nothing that he needs to be struggling with visually. When you look at the G's and the A's, you'll see the difference in the fonts and O and A on the bottom can confuse him. So we use the old, what I call the typewriter A, okay? I mentioned the dyslexia font there because that is very useful for him, but very difficult to import into most of the platforms or programs or whatever they are. Um, and CVI Scotland is referenced there if you want to read up on how they suggest to check for appropriate font size, et cetera. 
know what 2D images the student can interpret. Um, I highly encourage you to view Matt Tejan's webinars and his 2D image assessment information that you'll find in chapter four of Advanced Principles. Um, I put these images on the screen to show you a point that Matt drives home is that a solid color image that's realistic is the easiest. Notice how different the cow in the middle looks just by introducing um, the, the two colors of the cow. And the far right is an image, uh, it's, it's a picture that was hanging in a dentist's office. And so we took a picture of it um, to compare it so that he could identify this exemplar. Using vision is very hard work for individuals with CVI. Um, visual batteries are very short, very different um, for individuals with CVI. And a good, a good quote for all of us is just because he can, doesn't mean he should. He might be able to read that smaller font, but what's the purpose um, when it's going to exhaust his visual battery very quickly. Just because he looks doesn't mean he interprets what he sees. We all need to really understand this. Please ask, what do you see? Not, what is this? So on the left-hand image, that was my first big aha. When I asked River, what do you see? His answer, the man in jail. Hmm, that really caught my attention. And the right-hand image, we share a lot of information with him from um, the newspaper. I'll pick out a sentence or two and we'll connect it to his experiences. Um, I asked him if he could identify. I said, what do you see in, this, in the image? And he could not disembed the leopard from the rest of the image. Just keeping things like that in mind because remember that if if you're working with images in any kind of educational material or images anywhere, you need, to, you need to make sure you understand what the student can interpret. All right, there we go, okay. Individuals with CVI require a mediator. Now, it's very easy to understand that my work with him is one-on-one. -on -one. So all the examples that I share with you are one-on-one, -on -one, but I hope you begin to grasp the need for mediators um, to not only customize activities, experiences, and all parts of the day, but to be explicit, be available, to build on the child's knowledge as the visual library with an individual with cortical visual impairment is most likely fragmented, incomplete, and inaccurate. Let me show you what I mean here. My role is immediate. Take a look at this whole picture here. What do you see here? A bell. A bell. Does this bell have a special name? Um, the, the big, huge bell. Okay. Does it look like? That has a crack in it. That has a crack in it. And it, we went to see the bell, and I got a um, toy. Um, Chalk, where we went to see the bell. Uh -huh. Can you tell me what these things are? That Chains. They are what, sweetie? American flag. American flag. And what do you think the rest of them behind this Liberty Bell are? I don't know. Don't know? If this is one flag hanging here? There's another flag. Do you think that's... And you see these points up here? Yeah. Okay, those are the endpoints of the flagpole. Okay. Okay. So you see, I put a, a small Liberty Bell on top, um, just in case I had that available, just in case he couldn't disembed the big bell on the bottom. And by the way, later he told me that that was the Liberty Bell, but he couldn't recall it at the time. I can relate to that. Um, Stephanie, I have a... Um, a message here that says set up professional audio in audio settings. I'm going to click that. No, I can't click that off. So I just want you to be aware that that's there. I don't know what that means. 
Um, CVI characteristic of difficulty with visual complexity. Um, Judy, I, I'm going to interrupt really fast. Do you need me to help you get rid of that? Well, yeah, if you can. Um, I don't. I just don't know what it means, so I don't want to go. I don't know what it means either. I don't have it on my end. Do you want yeah. to? If you do a command tab, it might go back to your main slide. Alrighty, command tab. Well, we'll leave it there. If okay. You, yeah. Oh, we'll leave it there. Thank you, though. All right, sorry, Judy. Um, so this this image uh, gives you a sense of if if you're like me, I'm just like whoa. Um, this shows you all the aspects of an overly visual complex environment. Um, and just picture when you add a teacher and students and noise and commotion movement, it it's a disaster in in the making. Okay, so we go on to explain to you. Uh, to show you difficulty with visual complexity, target and task. Um, right in this one, I knew that my grandson had had it when I put him the screen in front of him on the left and he began trying to enlarge the text in the way that you see on the right. He gave me a clear signal that there was just too much here. Um, so we're coaching him to try to be uh, more proactive and to speak up when he needs a break. Um, the signal he gave me was clear, so I didn't really need to ask him much more. Complexity of array. Okay, so that includes all that can be seen by the eyes. So the same content on the left here, I made available to him by adjusting the font, the size, and the spacing of the text. Because keep in mind, please, that more text equals more complexity. Okay. Now you saw the image on the right, and you saw how I mentioned that we'll connect a 3D with a 2D when possible. Um, but notice, um, you, well, you wouldn't have seen the original one, but all extraneous information is removed um, and for my grandson, that means images too. They are, we keep them separate. The image on the right, I did want him to see that diagram. I wanted him to begin being familiar with a diagram, the word and how we go about um, working with it. So on this slide, you see that uh, I thought I could use the words on the left. I thought if I separated them into two different pages that and made them appropriate size that he could read them, but it was too much. So I fixed them up as you see them with the presentation on the right and it was totally appropriate for him and we read through them. And he could then compare what all those little tiny buttons on his camera with the numerals and the information on this presentation on Google Slides. Complexity of the sensory environment. If, completing, if competing sensory information is novel to River, he's likely to stop and attend to it. If it is known, he usually works right through it. Um, motion will definitely distract him. Um, I suggest, and you've heard the recommendation probably, um, it's not mine, it's what I was told, to coach correct talk to him after or before he's engaged with a visual target. Now, you'll hear me interject with him as we're working. Um, this is a comfortable rhythm for him. Um, I try to be as brief as possible, but I also am involved in correcting him and coaching him, and um, you'll hear me in action in a few, few upcoming slides. Some of the strategies we use to reduce sensory complexity would be headphones. It's back to the action in the room, especially if there's more people, consistency of the work environment, and we'll often use a trifold. The characteristics of complexity of the human face. Just the other day, uh, he was looking at some, some photographs and he confused his mama with me. Discriminating faces is very different. Um, please don't say, look at me when I'm talking to you. It's kind of a holdover from a certain generation. And if anybody tries that with your individual, your student, please encourage them not 
to expect eye contact because when they look, do not assume they can discriminate facial features and do not assume that they can look at you and listen to what you're saying at the same time. So if you think about this, what I've just mentioned to you, think about the images that come across the screen in daily life, in one-on-one -on -one connections and in human interactions, our individuals are missing so much in the way of body language cues and facial features. Visually guided reach. Um, I'm gonna show you here something called Switch the Sounds as you see. It's an advanced um, phonemic awareness and phonics activity. You'll see how I reduced the complexity of the array, how I provided consistent, predictable location of the vowels and the consonants, and how we used color. Um, in this, he demonstrates looking and reaching at the same time. But if and when I see look, look away, reach, okay, it is an indication to me that the task is overwhelming, um, possibly in its novelty or its sensory complexity, or if he is visually fatigued and just plain done with the activity, um, you'll, then I know that's my cue. Okay, I'm going to make a word. We're playing switch the sounds. Desk. That's what letter is this? Desk. This is desk. Okay. Now, you're going to be able to switch. Whoa, hold on. Switch one letter and change desk to disc. Now we have disc. Well done. Okay. Let's change disc. Oh no, keep it there. We're going to switch a, one sound, make it risk. Mm, what letter do you need that I don't have? R. We need an R. I will find an R on my pile. Here's your R, sir. What's our word? Risk. Excellent. Okay, now change risk to rust. Say rust. Short value, uh, what's your word? Rust. Change, whoop, say it again. Rust. Yeah, rust, that's a nonsense. Wait, hold on, hold on. Think of something? It goes here. Mm-hmm, with the consonants. Oh, what'd you make? Rust. Rust, well done. Okay. So now we're going, we're going to move into um, continuing to try to understand cortical, my framework that I present, the cortical visual impairment literacy framework, and we're going to look at the program components. When I refer to program components, I'm talking about a stru structured literacy program, supplemental programs to target student needs based upon the science of reading. And this includes explicit systematic instruction in the five core areas identified in the National Reading Panel Report, phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, comprehension, fluency, and spelling and writing. Well, let me talk to you a little bit about what the science of reading is. Science of reading is a vast interdisciplinary body, of scientifically based research about reading and issues related to reading and writing. It includes research conducted over the last five decades and researchers from the following fields contributed, cognitive psychology, communication sciences, developmental psychology, education, implementation science, linguistics, neuroscience, and school psychology. You can see how extensive the work was. What is the science of reading? 
Um, I am highly encouraging you to watch this five minute, that's all it is, a brief introduction to the science of reading by Stephanie Stoller, well worth it. And if you're asking, is my child or is my school's program following the science of reading? I encourage you to check out the Reading League curriculum evaluation, green flags, it's, it's a nice chart and the green flags will indicate instructional practices that are aligned with the science of reading and red flags show you the parts that are not, the practices that are not aligned. So what does the science of reading recommend for these pillars? Now, today I'm gonna only be able to talk about phonemic awareness. Due to our time limit, we'll start at least applying information to that pillar. So it all starts with speech. It all starts with the sound, okay? Our brains are wired for speech, but they're not wired for reading. Early on, children are used to attending to the meaning of what they hear. So now we're starting to ask them to attend to the sounds and they have to learn how to attend to the sound. All learners need to be taught how to focus on sound. This shows you a phonological awareness continuum. I want you to notice, please, the less complex, the top arrow moving to the more complex skills. Notice the arrows at the bottom. The very long one shows you that all of this is phonological awareness. And that when you move into the individual sounds, you talk about phonemic awareness. Notice the arrow pointing up, straight up to the box that says segment words into sounds. That is critical to early learning success. Let me show you a little bit more. This umbrella of phonological awareness, skills of words, syllables, onset rhymes, and phonemes um, is another way to represent all of these terms. I'm gonna help you, um, I think the information at the bottom is important to help define some of the terms um, you may be unfamiliar with. So phoneme awareness is the ability to notice, think about, or manipulate the individual phonemes or the sounds in words. You saw us doing that in one of the videos. Onset and rhyme. The onset is the beginning sound. The rhyme is the vowel plus the rest of the sound. So you see the example there, cat. The onset is C and the rhyme is AT. Different from rhyming words like cat and bat. Phoneme is the smallest unit of sound within our language. So a phoneme combines with other phonemes to make words. Grapheme is that letter or letter combination that sells a phoneme. It can be one, two, three, or four letters in English. And orthographic mapping, probably another term you haven't heard. That's how the sounds map to the corresponding spelling. So that is a that is referred to a lot in the research about how individuals learn how to read. So it's so very important that we offer language rich environments to our children and that we work to help them learn how to identify the sounds that they hear in words. The phonological practices aligned with the science of reading. That's what this information is. So the following are supported by scientific evidence. The first is direct, explicit, and systematic instruction of all phonemic awareness tasks, isolating phonemes, blending phonemes, segmenting phonemes, deletion, substitution, and reversal of phonemes, along with larger units, syllables, and onset rhyme. Phoneme awareness is, establishing, is established prior to introduction of the corresponding graphemes. All levels of phonological and phoneme awareness are assessed and monitored regularly. 
and phonemic awareness and letter sound correspondences should be explicitly and systematically taught through second grade. Now remember that we're just, I'm just focusing on the phonological awareness research here and not the other pillars, the other areas. So why is phonological awareness or phonemic awareness very important? Because individuals need to learn that printed letters represent phonemes in spoken words. So that is the alphabetic principle. And make no mistake, it is phoneme level awareness skills that directly support learning to read and spell. So when we talk about an individual with CVI, Dr. Christine Roman Lancy helps us understand when the time is to introduce symbols to an individual with CVI. And if you haven't read these in her work before, I remind you, the individual needs to be able to access the ventral stream and demonstrate eye to object fixation. The learner has a repertoire of well-known or familiar readily recognizable target objects. And the last prerequisite is that the learner can identify salient features of some known targets. I encourage you to see the second edition for more information on the two streams of visual processing. I'm hoping this information is useful to you. Um, it's a way of showing you what the research is telling us about phonological awareness. Now, granted, these are all estimates of the time frame. Um, in each oval, there's a direct in, there is direct instruction focused on awareness of the target sounds in spoken words. So in pre-K, you are developing phonological sensitivity. So the awareness of rhymes, onsets, and syllables. In kindergarten, phoneme awareness enters instructional components. So the sounds that you first work with are in simple syllable patterns like go, which is consonant vowel, up, you see, and cat. And in grades one and two, more complex early phoneme awareness skills are taught in spoken words. And you see there the C is representing consonants, V is vowel, and you see how the word both gets longer and includes more sounds from the individual letters. The sequence of phonemic awareness development this information is important because you want to understand that the easiest begin is the beginning phoneme and then the ending phoneme. That progresses to awareness of internal phonemes. And the internal phonemes are going to get more complex as mentioned previously when more letters representing sounds are added. So that information is there for you. You'll, you saw how we progressed from easy using the known meaningful words, especially important for CBI learners. And then we move into harder novel words. Use phoneme identification and segmentation tasks to find out the student's development of awareness skills. Segmenting words into phonemes should be smooth and effortless. So for example, if a student is still struggling to separate and segment the phonemes in a three letter word like consonant, vowel, consonant, then you would not go on to the more difficult words with more sounds until they are smoothly and effortlessly able to segment and blend the three sounds together. Letters represent sounds, okay? Even children know that letters can't talk. Now it, it is a big deal. So that's why you'll hear me say over and over, that letter, what sound does that letter represent? We do our best not to add extra sounds to individual phonemes. So when we say the sound that is represented by the symbol D, 
He said, D -d -d not duh. Teach new sounds using words the individual is familiar with. As mentioned, no, move from the knowns to the unknowns and from the easy to the hard. So I'm gonna share with you um, deliberately, there's nothing to see here because this is all phonemic awareness assessment and practice activities, okay? Mm, it's a little rough, <laughs> a little rough filming, so bear with me. Okay, River and I are going to demonstrate how we might both assess the sounds, the phoneme awareness skills, and practice them. So these same assessment techniques can be used for practicing. So River, we're going to, I'm going to ask you to tell me the sounds that you hear in certain words that I say. Okay, so let's start out. We're going to be, this part, I'm going to ask you to tell me the sound. So I'm going to say a word, and then I'm going to ask you, what is the first sound in the word? Here's the word, ma. What's the first sound? Ma. What's the last sound in this word? Cut. What is the middle sound in this word? Gus. Ah. Uh. Okay. Now, if we take a rubber band and we pull it apart, we stretch out what we are doing. We stretch out our sounds, okay? Yeah. Well, we're going to do some stretching out and we're going to also do some segmenting. That's taking each sound by itself. Okay. So we're going to start with an easy syllable first, and then we're going to go to a harder syllable. Okay. First syllable. I want you to say each of the speech sounds in the word that I say. Oh. Oh. Op. Uh. Pop. Up. Uh. Plop. Plop. Slow that down again for me. Plop. All right, there's going to be, listen together. Uh. Ah. Uh. You repeat it. Uh. Ah. Uh. Okay, I didn't hear that ah sound the first time you did it. Okay, here's another one. You ready? Yeah. Remember, I said they're getting harder. Post. Post. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to blend the sounds together. We're going to smush them together after I say them. So listen to the sounds, and then you smush them together. Okay, ready? Yeah. Uh, ah. Plop. Excellent. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Gonna give you a harder one. St. A. M. P. Stump. Excellent. All right. Now we're gonna go to one last task that we're doing all just with talking, not looking at anything. Listen carefully, because I'm gonna ask you to compare two words with a special question. Does fig start with the same sound as fill? Yeah. Okay. Do you know what letter represents that sound? F. Okay. Does shut end with the same sound as cut? Yeah. What letter represents that sound? T. Does gab have the same middle sound as Map. Yeah. A. A is the letter that represents A. Well done. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next one. This is an explanation by me. Hi. Before I put my actor on the screen, we're going to be demonstrating Alconan boxes. And I just want to mention a few things to you. They also go by the name of word boxes or letter boxes. And it it is an instructional technique that is research-based. It helps learners identify sounds that they hear 
in words. Um, we use counters, we move into letters. These act as neural markers for the sounds that are heard. Um, our students need deliberate and explicit and structured practice identifying the sounds that they hear in words, taking them apart, putting them back together. And you'll see in the end of the video when we move into using letters, the benefit of using letters is that it moves the learner into decoding. Um, all of our activities follow a, a structure of I do, so it's demonstrated. We do, we work together, followed by you do, which is monitored and specific feedback is given. Corrections can be made on the spot. This is just one of the many activities, but I highly encourage you to get your learners involved. And again, you don't need to be using Alcona boxes. You can be doing oral phonemic awareness activities throughout your day, wherever you are. You can even substitute tapping on a finger, listening to the sounds in the word cat, at just so you help the learner identify the sounds that are heard. Okay, we'll show for you um, some of the some of the thoughts we have, some of the things we've done. Okay, this video is a little rough, so bear with me, but I think you'll understand as we get going. River, what our job here is to work on hearing the sounds that make up words. So I'm going to ask you to follow my directions. I'm going to do the job first, then we're going to do it together, then you're going to do it separately. The magnet, by the way, looks like that. Okay, thank you. That's one, one cut type we're going to use. Okay, so here's our first word. All right, watch me because I'm going to demonstrate. Our first word is us. Uh, so watch. And the other magnet looks like that. Okay, we're going to use the red ones, so you can put those down. Watch this. I'm going to show you the sounds in us. Uh, us. Now, I'm going to show you a different way to do that. We can do a lot of these here. Let's do this together. You ready? Mm -hmm. All right, ready? Do it with me. Say us. Us. Let's stretch it out now. Us. us. What's our word? Us. Good. All right, let's try a new one. You're going to try it all by yourself. You ready? All right. Show me us all by yourself. Us. Oh, can't be. Just one magnet for each sound. First sound. Us. Second sound. Us. Okay. Now, for everybody's benefit, this is something that is a typical presentation of boxes for something called Elkonin boxes. Now, because of the complexity, I usually adjust it so that it looks like this. That's what we're going to work with today. The color helps us see the boxes. There's only three, but like here is four. Excellent. I'm glad you showed me that. We can work with three boxes. We're going to start with small words and we're going to work toward longer three sound words. And this makes four sounds available. We can always add another sticky note and have another sound box. Yeah. Okay. All right. We've already done a two sound word. Okay. Anchor our paper there, please. All right, ready for a three sound word? Put that up in the corner, please. Now, River is demonstrating how using magnets like this can be a distraction at times. So put it up. Okay, ready? I'm going to demonstrate first. Next word pet. Okay, your hand down. Uh, pet. And you're going to do it. No, I'm putting it here. All right, fine. Uh, pet. How many sounds in our word pet? Et. Three. Good. 
Now, it's a little harder to stretch out the P sound. We can't do that. So it's more of a clip sound. At. At. Okay, that's how we stretched it out. That. At. I know, it sounds that. like funny. All right, let's try another one. Ready? We can stretch this one out. I'm going to say the word sun. Say it, please. Sun. Let's do it together. Um. Um. What's our word? Oh, we need that back there. What's our word? Sun. Sun. Okay. Take the three off, please. Oh, that's a good idea. Push them down. Okay, let's try one more. Let's try sun without stretching it out. Let's try it by segmenting the sounds. Ready? Sun. You do it. Push it up. Sun. All right, let's try that again because that wasn't really clear. Watch me do it. Ready? Uh. Mm. Uh, mm. Okay. Mm. Well, no, 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 we're not doing back. No, we're not. We're not doing it backwards. S that would confuse your brain, right? Yes. Okay, try sun again. Very nicely done. Okay, now I'm going to show everyone one more thing that River and I do because he's used to three sound words, he's used to four sound syllables. So now when we're working with a multi-syllabic word, River, say upstairs. All right, set it down, please. Okay, we now are going to use cards to show syllables. Up and stairs. Put it right next to it. We're making a word upstairs. So then what we would do is we would take our first syllable up and we'd listen for the sounds in up. Tell me the sounds in up. Uh. Good. That would be up stairs. That goes up. If I put it like that, up stairs. I got it. Okay. So let's concentrate on the syllable stairs. S do it with me. St oh. A. Uh, well, that gets kind of long there, doesn't it? That last syllable. Yeah. Okay. So basically, what we're going to try to do is go from lots of lots of experience working with sounds to moving into letters. So, sure, go back here for a second, and I'm going to put our letters up here for you. Okay. Can you please take a look at them? We have our consonants in the blue, and we have our vowels in the, what color? Red. The red, okay. Now, we don't need the magnets. Oh, we're not playing now. We need the magnetic letters. Are you ready? I want you to try this word. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Pet. Give me the sounds, please. Say it first. Okay, let's just put it in the box. Okay. Uh. Oh, now. Oh, all right. I see what you did, but. Past. Past, but. Cut. Oh, I see. There was not another box for past. So here, try it on this one. Take your letters. Try it on this one. Go ahead. Oh, now they're stuck, aren't they? What? Uh, we're just a fumble mess here. <laughs> this is what happens sometimes with. You're still video. Yep, I know I am. So go yeah. ahead. I want to see pet. So I think you got the the idea there, um, and you can see. Um, my actor was getting a little bit at the end of his um, visual battery and his <laughs> concentration there at the end. Um, but I think he got the message. 
So I'm gonna show you the next two screens. We're out of time, so I'm not gonna go into them, but I wanted to make available to you. Um, here you see some of our early phonological sensitivity and awareness activities. Um, I include some of the things that we did early on. At the bottom is an article I wrote that will give you some additional ideas. And here is our ongoing phonemic awareness activities where we are working with pairing the phonemes with the graphemes. Here are my sources. They will be available to you upon completion of, uh, I guess, the posting. Um, I want to thank you for joining me and hanging in there. I hope I've given you some ideas that you can use, but I've uh, I do sincerely hope that I have made it very, very clear that you need to know your learner, you need to understand your learner's CVI, visual and behavioral characteristics, the phase the student is in, all based on the work of Christine Roman Lancy, combining that with good, solid instruction that is built upon the science of reading, what the, re the experts know about how we learn how to read, and that will give our students with CVI, with whatever their needs are, the best chance for their appropriate level of literacy development. Okay, thanks for joining me. Stephanie, take Thank it you so much for all of that information. I really appreciate it. And I know our viewers do too. Everyone stayed with us the entire time, even though we had this hangover a little bit, which shows how important this information really is for everybody. Um, as a reminder, this was being recorded, but some of the videos that have River in them may be removed at the discretion of Judy and his mother. So we'll take a look at those first before we post it onto our YouTube channel. Um, any questions that we um, are not able to answer, but we've got some of it in the chat. Uh, we will make sure to respond to via email. So if you've got a, a few questions kind of lingering there that you would like to have followed up on, please feel free to put those in the chat now, or you can email me directly. And my email is stephanies at cviconnect.co, and I'm also putting that in the chat. I also did put a couple of the links that Judy was mentioning throughout her presentation in the chat. So you can go ahead and click, click on those. But as Judy mentioned, we will also make sure these resources are available in that post email that we are planning to send to you all. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate your time this afternoon or super early in the morning for some of you. Um, and we really appreciate um, you all joining us and continuing to work hard for your learners with CVI together as a community, we can do better. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too.